You are watching a clip from the most recent TCM vodcast here on YouTube. If you enjoy, feel free to like and subscribe, and you can find the full video on our YouTube channel right now. But first, we're going to talk about England's white ball team, because uh, for the first time uh, this year, they are in action in an ODI series against South Africa as we speak this very minute. Now, I'm not really sure what's going on in the context of the game, so let's keep it quite um, general, and I presume when this goes out, we'll know the result. Um, so, Hudson, I'll start with you. We're in a World Cup year now. How do you feel... In, how do you feel England's team is doing heading into uh, a World Cup later this year? I mean, it's hard to judge. We haven't played one day cricket in such a long period of time. But after what was a blow past summer, this, is, this series being quite low key, sandwiched in amongst a franchise league and everything else going on in the world game, it kind of ideal to get back on the ODI horse for England. Just there's a few, a lot of players you don't expect in this series to actually make that final eleven come India at later this year. So it's a lot it's opportunities for some to prove themselves and for others to almost last chance saloon and if anything to make their way into that what will likely be a fifteen man squad come October time. Yeah, and obviously one big story this week has been the return of Joffre Arch. And now he didn't go too well today in the first innings. But Rob, in general, how good is it to see such an attacking pace bowler back in our side? Do you think it's been what we've missed We've missed from this uh, England white ball side? It's huge. Um, I don't think it can quite be stated enough how much of a difference we go, this England side goes from just having, you know, Wopes, Willie and the other sort of, medium fast bowlers that's still a very good pace bowling attack in itself but you add in a fit Joffre Archer a fit Mark Woods if he's around and playing it just a couple of extra extra factors though Ollie Stone today picked up a wicket first ball into his spell and I think was generally quite economical so you know as, as well as um well what was it Jamie is it Jamie Overton who's just gone down with another stress fracture yeah I think so, so, so while we've still while we're losing yet more fast bowlers to stress fractures, you know, so keep a moods now getting back to some sort of fitness level, so he will be coming back into the mix. You know, we've now getting the core group of our fast bowlers back, which I think can only be a positive. And I think the thing that the ECB just have to work out for or watch out for, which they're doing with Jofra, it is is the workloads of these bowlers because Jofra has already come out and said he wants to play in the Ashes, which is great. You know, if we can get him fit and firing in the Test side again, that would be amazing. But we do have to be sensible with his workload coming back off what is effectively three years out of the game. Yeah, I, I agree there. I think it's great to see him back. I don't think anyone's going to dispute that at all. Um, Harrison, you mentioned a bit in your in your first answer there about you, we don't know who's in this 11. We don't know who's the best players in our 11, essentially. Uh, and, you know, you've got people like Ollie Stone, um, Jason Roy... Ben Duckett, Harry Brook, loads of different players. It feels like we've got so much depth. If you are Josh Butler going into and Matthew Mark going into the World Cup, how do you look to narrow down this broad group of, of players into a team that's going to take us to defend our World Cup title? I think ultimately you have to give everyone a fair chance. If you're not, especially Mark, still in ODI terms, is new to the role, he wants, he's going to want to learn his own, find out his own things about these players rather than. Also, you've got the past bank of stats and history and records and matches and whatnot that will undoubtedly be used too. But ultimately, the here and now is what we're in. And if players perform under him, they're going to make stake their claim to make these squads. And we're looking at now Roy and Milan are you know, batting together 80 for naught, looking good themselves. Those two, obviously, you'd imagine Bairstow, one, once he's back fit, comes back in. So you feel they're maybe playing for one spot with Root probably in the number three batter as well. So it's like, it's these small little things England got to look at. They've got these three games against South Africa, the three against Bangladesh before the home summer, I think. So those are these like these six games are a good chance, especially the ones in Bangladesh, conditions similar to that of India come the World Cup. So those are the big chances for the fringe players, such as Harry Brook or Ben Duckett, who's also playing today to especially in that batting group to push their claims. And on Jason Roy, I think Jason Roy is a very interesting topic going into this year. Um He's not been in great form, I think it's fair to say. Uh, some people will be saying he doesn't make that World Cup 11 towards the end. He didn't get a central contract, interestingly. 
Uh, Rob, where do you stand on the Jason Roy situation? Do you think he's still England's best opening batsman, or do you think it's time to give other people a shot because of the depth that Harrison was mentioning there? We've got so many people, I'd be inclined to go, it's time for him to step aside. Because it, let's be honest, this form has been quite consistent. I know we've not played many ODIs recently, but he's not been in great form for a while now. What would you do with Jason Roy, Rob? Well, this is the thing, you know, he missed out on that World Cup squad to Alex Hales, whether that, I think that's fifth, that's part because Alex Hales' record in Australia was ridic is ridiculously good and then part Roy's form has been appalling. He hasn't he hasn't been England's best opening batter in white ball cricket for about 12 months now. Johnny Bairstow's, I think, been quite comfortably the better player. That being said, I do still find value in Jason Roy being in the squad. I can't justify starting him at the minute because, personally, I think Phil Salt has... He sat behind enough people for as long... Bantish as Phil Salt, may I just add? Correct, correction, where has he spent the majority of his career? Sussex, uh, thank well, you very much. Uh, all, all I know is that he's played Shush, like... Shush you! No, um, I'm not <laughs> no, so I think Phil, Phil Salt is, for me, the most obvious one to come up and take his place. Obviously, Dan Milan's getting the shot today, and Butler said that Milan and Roy were they going to be the preferred duo for this opening game anyway. I think based on the current performance, they're probably going to get the second game together as well. I think Roy should make the 15. I can't justify putting him in the 11 because, as I said, you've got Darren Milan in there who can do, who can open or who can bat three. So that's a real good double option there. Joe Root could potentially jump up to open if you need it the last minute. You know, there's potential. There's rumours of if Ben Stokes is going to retire well, unretire, sorry, and come back into the squad. So then you have to, there's that, that will have to be factored in. You know, Matthew Mott's not exactly been coy about saying that we'll have that chat when it gets to it, basically saying if, if Stokes is fit and he wants it, he'll come back into the side. So I think you go down the list, uh, Milan, Salt, Duckett, Smead, Will Jacks, that's five players right there who can say they've had a better last 12 months than Jason Roy has had in white ball cricket. Roy has the credit of being the real aggressor of the white ball side since 2015, eight years ago in that reset that we did. But at the end of the day, credit runs out. And in, you know, ODI cricket is now more, taking more and more of a back step. We have less time to prepare for the World Cup. So I think there's now less room for error on everyone's part to state their claims. So for me, I think at this moment in time, Roy makes the final 15 man squad as kind of your, your cover opening batter but does he get in the starting 11 no he doesn't yeah i mean it's an interesting debate and i'm sure it'll be talked about more across the coming months um an interesting hypothesis here is does england know or will they know by the time they get to that world cup about who their best 11 actually is i mean there are so many different combinations that you can have due to the depth of this side harrison do you think that by the time that first ball is bowled in the world cup england will have their best 11 there for them or is this a case of they're never gonna know but it doesn't matter what do you think about that i think they will know their best 11 they did for the T20 World Cup last year, built, building up to that series. Obviously, Pakistan was missing a few players, but they had those games against Australia, and you could see then where they were going with their 11. And by a few changes throughout the tournament, they knew enough stuck with it. In the ODI, as you say, we've discussed it as well. There's so many spots up for grabs right now, or spots we're not sure of, but there's so many, you've got a big block of games in September, especially right before that World Cup, that's going to help shape the squad big time. And I think. Mott and Butler by the end of that month will know at least 10 of their players, if not all 11. Yeah, and I just want to touch on one more player before we uh, put in some early predictions about whether England are going to uh, defend their World Cup title. Uh, and that's Harry Brook, because he's been sensational last year. He had a great year in cricket. In terms of ODI cricket, uh, Rob, do you think you can see Harry Brooks starting uh, consistently or would you rather he stuck to test cricket? And do you think this is, I just think personally, this is going to be the year of Harry Brooks. So uh, what do you think of him? I don't think he should stick to test cricket because if he can balance all three formats, then we are looking at someone who has the quality to be as good as Joe Root has been in the England shirt, in my opinion. However, when you look at this England squad at the minute, Liam Livingston, when he's fit, will still come back into this ODI side. He'll come in and take his spot. So that probably puts 
Moeen, I think, is batting at six today, so Moeen will probably drop down to seven. If Ben Stokes unretires, he's going to walk straight back into that side in the middle order, you know, as the perfect player who can give you five overs if you need it. We know how good he is with the bat. So the question I find myself, does, do, do we? this is going to sound really harsh, do we need Harry Brook in this ODI side? Do we Do we need him? Um, you know, he's making his debut today. So this is the thing. He's not going to have a lot of ODI cricket to get, he's not going to have a lot of time in an ODI arena to get his feet under him. And if he takes to ODI cricket the same way he's taken to test in T20, then we're in for a treat. But I think at this moment in time, you probably have to say, well, for me, I'd say he's probably the 16th or 17th man in that squad in terms of anyone in that 15, anyone in that final 15 that goes down, for me, he'd be the first one you call up to put in that middle order, can bat four, you could probably push him to three if you really needed the two. Um, but yeah, I think the question, you mentioned there about the depth and versatility we have. You don't want it to become a curse. You don't want to have so many options that you're then fiddling around trying to shoehorn players in where they're not comfortable. So, look, we all know what Liam Livingston can do when he gets himself rolling. You know, there's not many more explosive batters in the world than Liam Livingston when he's in. So if you can say, Stoke, if we say hypothetically Stokes does unretire and makes himself available and obviously England will pick him, you know, you're looking at the top three, the top four kind of being as they are and then Joss Butler being the floater that he is coming in anywhere from four to seven. Uh, ben Stokes, Liam Livingston, Mo and Ali can hit a long ball at the end of the innings. That's your middle order, and with Brook not being able to bowl, we can't really sacrifice much else because the bowling has been the weak point of this side for a little bit. So, yeah, I think ultimately Brook might just miss out. I think for me at the minute he misses out um, because he just hasn't played. He actually just hasn't played ODI cricket. He hasn't played. He hasn't played. So I think for me that's where he misses out. But you know, he's not exactly a bad guy to have as your 16th, 17th man to come in if there's an injury to a player that rules them out to the tournament. Brook is a more than able replacement to come back into that squad. Yeah, well, you've named there loads of different players. And I think it's fair to say that we've got a strong side on paper. So I'd like to, on January the 27th, 2023... Put in our predictions about whether England are going to defend this World Cup title. I'm going to go first. I'm going to say, yes, we are. And we're going to beat everyone. And that's that. Which is probably terrible because I've just put a curse on English cricket. Um, but I think with the depth and strength that we've got, there is surely, at the moment, no ODI side that's better than us. Uh, Rob, we'll come to you first. What are you thinking? I'm going to be controversial. Oh, you're not? I don't think we will. I think wow. the lack of ODI cricket that's now going to be played, I'm not sure exactly how much ODI, how many ODI games we're going to play between now and the World Cup. But I know it's nowhere near as much preparation as we had for our home World Cup in 2019. And, you know, we have a very bad injury record at the minute. Mm. Who's to say, you know, all it takes is for Butler to say tear his hamstring in a freak accident or whatever, you know, a la Ben Folks before New Zealand 2019 or whatever it was, you then have all sorts of questions of who's going to captain, who's going to wiki keep, who's going to lead out in the field. That then just creates so many questions. Bowlers can easily go down with a stress fracture. What if Jofra, because ECB are trying to manage his workload, what if knows one of those games that he plays, he picks up a niggle and can't bowl for it, can't bowl for a while. What happens if Ollie Stone goes down again? So keep him move, can't, you know, can't get back to full fitness. Chris Wokes goes down with an injury. There's a lot of... I, get, I know I'm taking a negative approach here, but I think the, also the rest of the world, the rest of the sides have caught up a fair bit to England. And you mentioned there's still a relatively new combination of Mott and Butler leading the ship. You know, Butler's been around international cricket for God knows how long. But, you know, Mott, as Harrison said, he's still trying to find out his own combination of players, how he wants to sort of play although we have the blueprint right, right out in front of us but you know I th there's a there's a lot of variables I don't think we I don't think we're going to get as much of the luck of the green as we did in the 2019 World Cup because if you remember we were in semi we were in knockout mode from effectively our fourth or fifth group game in because if we lost any more if we lost one more group game we were out of the tournament you know then obviously count back boundary count whatever you want to say that happens I don't think we can rely on that happening again and that happening in our favour so, yeah, I think 
do we have the talent to do it? Absolutely. I don't think talent wise, many teams stock up to stock up to us. But I just, I don't know. There's just something off to me this year about the lack the lack of ODI cricket that we're going to play in preparation. I don't think I don't think it's going to work out for us. So Rob's the cynic then. Um, but Harrison, looking into your crystal ball, and we know you've got a track record for great predictions. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you thinking? What are you thinking for this year? Yes or no for England to win the ODI World Cup uh, later this year? Well, I did back England in the T20 World Cup in November and that one paid off, but I'm not going to be as pessimistic. I like how you slipped that in there. Yeah, just, I just know. had to. Just had to pad it out a bit. But I'm not going to be as pessimistic as Rob, but I don't think we will win it as well. Purely because... What has happened? What has happened? Purely because India and home conditions, they've seen of late albeit they haven't played some of the best ODI sides in the world, they have built up serious momentum, you know, in conditions, Shukman Gill is looking in top form in their bowlers too. I think, no, through no fault of England's own, I think India is going to be the, a, the better side there in their own, own conditions, know their strengths and the way to play there, but not quite for England this time. 